right. Hello, everyone. Welcome again, if you've been with us for this entire time from the beginning, or welcome now to Malmö, Sweden, uh, one of the headquarters of near 4 j We're here in the offices, and I'm Andreas Kolliger from the community team, and I'm sitting here with the CEO and one of the founders of near 4 j Emil Ephraim. How's it going? Great to be here. And well, th thanks for sitting down on the couch with me again. This has been an amazing, you know, couple of sessions we've had now. I don't know how many hours it's been. Twelve hours yeah. of sessions running across the, the the planet, and really just an amazing time. Thank you, everyone who's been speaking. The sessions have been amazing. I feel like this has been one of those occasions where I feel comfortable canceling Netflix. Because <laughs> I just want to watch the recordings of all the sessions that I've missed. I just want to go back and like. There's so much good material, but. This session is about questions for you, ask me anything sort of style questions. Um, we have some great questions already lined up if people haven't asked questions yet. First, I'm gonna start with some slides to show you how we're gonna run things. So let me, let me cut over to our slides here. So, uh, hi, Emil and Andreas, also known as ABK. Hmm? And uh, here's how this is gonna work today. If you've been in the, the venue, the virtual venue that we have called Hopin, if you go to the reception tab on the left-hand side, you'll see on the pop, you know, this kind of the sidebar on the right, there's a tab called Ask Emil. Click on that, ask a question, upvote a question that's there. We're gonna try to answer like the top voted questions over the next 20-ish minutes. Um, but I promise every question that is asked, we're gonna answer, if not live today, now, I'll get back to you later. Somebody else will get back to you and we'll make sure that everyone who asks something will get a good answer for whatever you've asked about. But for now, we're gonna go into the top questions that we have here. And uh, Emil, actually, this is a, when, when we did the earlier Q&A, we had a bit of history of like, you know, near for j the name, where that came from, a bit of the origin story. This is also a part of the origin story. A lot of the speakers and people in the audience have had what we call a graph epiphany. They've realized graphs are pretty awesome. What was your graph epiphany that like got this whole thing started? Yeah, it's a good question. So we, we I guess it was the Americas that that kicked things off yesterday with nodes, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. we we did this the version of this session uh, last night here, um, and and talked a lot about kind of the origin story and and the name and all that kind of stuff, right? I guess this one a little bit of a different angle on it, mm -hmm. so. I got started, um, you know, I was programming since I was a tiny, teeny little, little wee, a wee lad, you know, <laughs> at whatever, 10 years old. And, and I've been programming for half my life when at 20, mm -hmm. I had a gap year uh, because of my military service and before starting college and joined a tiny little company, except they didn't call themselves a tiny little company. They used a weird word for it, which is they call themselves a startup, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and we were building enterprise content management systems. And it was a small company. We were 12 people, five in the engineering team. I became the CTO. I wasn't one of the founders, but I became the CTO of that, of that company. And we had a bunch of problems with the database. Mm -hmm. And even though I was, whatever, 20 years old, I've been programming a lot. And in all my projects, I think without any exceptions, the database had been a help. It had been an accelerator. It took right. this big gnarly problem, which is like, how do I store my data and make sure that it's there? Mm -hmm. Absolutely like no mess ups at all. It's durably there. Make it queryable in an easy way. Make it accessible across concurrent transactions, concurrent users, mixed read write workloads. That's a lot of hard work, <laughs> yeah. right? And if your job is, in my case, there's a lot of gaming, Right when I grew up, I, I built a lot of kind of multiplayer um, text-based games, right? This is a long time ago now, right? Um, that's what I wanted to focus on, mm -hmm. not you know, how do I actually get it to store on disk, right? And so then I pulled in whatever database we had at the time, which was typically MySQL or, or something like this. Um, and it always accelerated my development because I could then focus on building the game, not on that hard stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So then fast forward to this, this small startup that I joined and we were building enterprise content management systems, which is a lot of connected data because you have 
files that sit in folders. Those folders sit in folders. Mm -hmm. And then we added symlinks, symbolic links, which I guess in Windows is called shortcuts, right? So this folder could actually have multiple parents. And all of you in the audience, you probably know that that's mathematically where if you have nodes with multiple parents, that's mathematically when a tree turns into a graph, right? As we tried to shove that into the relational database, and it kind of worked, but man, was it painful. So remember, at a moment in time, there were 20 people in the engineering team. Half of them spent the majority of their time just fighting with the relational database, hmm. right? And that's when we realized something was wrong. This is just contrary to all of our experiences from before. And of course, today, whatever, 20 years later or something like that, as an industry, we have a very crisp understanding of this. We have a clear and, and good language for it. The abstraction here is there's a, there's a shape of data and there's a mismatch with the representation, with the abstractions, with the building blocks, right? We have a lot of connected data. We tried to shove that into tables, right? That's ultimately why it took so much time. It took us like a year to figure that out or like root cause analysis and asking mm. kind of the five whys a bunch of times, right? And ultimately realized that, yeah, that was the problem. And so that's when we realized, you know what? What if there was another database out there that worked exactly like we were on Informix and Oracle at the time and moved off of MySQL, but um, that worked exactly like Informix or Oracle. Um, it was kind of scalable and performant, had transactions, multi-users, a query language, all that kind of stuff, but just a different abstraction, a different data model. Mm -hmm. Instead of tables, what if we could work with information and model our data with nodes and relationships. And so that's ultimately, that was the trigger that, you know, down the path led us to, to build what today is Neo4j. Amazing. So born out of need, yeah. and then you thought, let's build our own database. How yeah. hard could that be? <laughs> How hard could it be? <laughs> it turns out decades later, it is, it is pretty hard, right? And, and, and so it was our own need. It was definitely scratching an itch that we had. Huh? I think there's one strategic insight that we had. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of flaws in our thinking and we took on something that was much harder than we expected. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the classic thing. If, if we had under understood back then what we understand now about how hard it is, we wouldn't have taken it on. You know, All kinds right. of naivete right. like that. But I think there's one kind of moment of clarity that we had though, which was a very, very simplistic view of the world, which is if you think of a, if you think of a chart with an y-axis and an x-axis, right? And the x-axis is actually, t-axis is time, right? The y-axis is how connected is the world? And you point it, take an arbitrary moment, moment in time. Now we're here, this is how connected the world is on the y-axis, right? As we move forward in time, will we go up or down? In other words, will the world become more or less connected? And just even that framing is so simplistic. Like anyone, a child would say, of course, everything can become more and more connected over time, right? And so a consequence of that is, if the world is becoming more connected, what is data? At this conference, we're talking a lot about data, we're talking a lot about information, but what is actually data? Well, data describes the world. It's a digital representation of the physical world. That is what data is. And as the world is becoming more and more connected, data will become more connected. And so we didn't know how many other people had the same problem that we had. Hmm. Was there? We, we figured there's gotta be other people out there. Is it five of them, 500, 5,000, 500,000? We have no idea. But we knew that tomorrow there's gonna be more and tomorrow there's gonna be even more, right? So there's a lot of scratching our own itch, but then we had this, this insight or at least belief that there was gonna be this wind behind our back where more people would have the same problem that we had tomorrow and the mm -hmm. following day. And then the internet and now, the metaverse someday, like to your point, like you know, the world is becoming more connected. That leads a little bit into this next question then from uh, Louise Almazan who asks, so given that background and that sort of insight, that intuition that like connectedness is growing, what do you see for Neo4j and graph databases in the next five, 10 years? Uh, which problems are there to solve ahead? Yeah. And you know, five, 10 years, who knows? But yeah. It's a good question, right? So if we're right about kind of that initial in intuition that the world is becoming more connected, right? Mm -hmm. Which I believe we are, then over time, over the next five to 10 years, 
we're just going to see more and more use cases that benefit from initially and over time require graph databases. And there's actually a couple of ways to think about that, right? One is entirely new things, right? So when the Panama Papers happened, right? Like yeah. that is like no one could have done that before on, at that scale without graph databases. It was not doable. So in some level, that's a new use case. But maybe even more present, I think, would be existing use cases that over time benefit from and then ultimately require a graph database. And my most recent favorite example of this is supply chain, right? So what is a supply chain? A supply chain is all the distribution that's required to get the parts for you to build your physical product, right? And 10 years ago, right, if you're building anything physical like this, right, you might have a supply chain that is two, three levels deep, right? If you wanted to digitalize that and analyze it, you can shove that into a relational database. You can do two, three joins. It's doable. It's right. not great. It's not a fantastic, but it works, right? Yeah. Fast forward to today, and anyone who's producing physical goods is tapping into this global fine grain mesh spanning continent to continent that is 20 levels deep or 30 levels deep, right? Yeah. It's, is it a year and a half ago now? summer 2021, the Suez Canal was blocked for a week. And the entire global supply chain got gobbed up because of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how can you analyze that? Well, if it's 20, 30 levels deep, you can no longer use a relational database for that. Mm -hmm. That is not doable. You have to use a graph database or put it in, all in memory in some kind of cache and really re-implement an in-memory graph database. Those are your only right. options, right? And so if you take a step back, what's happened there is that that's not a new use case per se. It's an existing use case. We're solving the same business problem. I want to understand my supply chain. If something happens, how, how will that affect my customers, my physical retail stores across America or Europe or Asia, right? It's the same business problem that we're solving. But because the world has become more connected, that use case now benefit from and ultimately will require a graph database. So when I look out over the next five to 10 years, there's just going to be more and more of those types of use cases. So that I think is, would be the, the, the first vector of, of change. The second vector, everything that I've talked about so far has really been with the framing of a developer, mm -hmm. right? That's my background. That's how I grew up. That is the, the first 10 years. That is not all we did, but the, by far, most of what we did, right? Neo4j as a backend to the world's applications, right? A really exciting newer area for us, of course, is the is the growth of graph data science. Yeah, and that's an entire. I can get. I mean, we're, we don't have too much time. We can talk for five, ten minutes just about that. But I think that like the rise of graph data science over the next five to ten years in the world of, uh, in the world of graphs is going to be as impactful as as that 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 first vector that we discussed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And looking through the sessions that we've had in the last couple of days and the ones that are coming up still in, in Europe later, that balance is present, right? Like there's yeah. like huge amounts of application development in all domains and then graph data science, equal partners like through all of this stuff. It's amazing to watch. Okay, stepping back a little bit and getting a little, little more personal, if you would, uh, about Neo4j. This next question from our, our good friend, Michael Hunger, whose name I've seen in, in the conference I, I, here and I, there. I, I, I recognize that you know, name somehow, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, he asks, you know, so what were some of the highlights for you personally as a new for j CEO? Um, and then as a small follow-up, do you, do you still, still code? code? <laughs> Technical founder, yeah, yeah. are you still? He's putting me on the spot. <laughs> do you want live coding yeah, session? Yeah. Is that what? Yeah. Man, highlight on my house. Man, it, there's just so many. This, this has been the journey of a lifetime, of mm. course, right? Like the only thing that rivals it for me personally is I'm, I, I'm, I'm a dad, I'm a father of of three girls, as as you know, my my middle daughter and, and your daughter were born within same month. Two, two weeks, it? Is I it two think, weeks yeah, even? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the only thing that can rival like this this exceptional journey. Um, it's very hard to call out like one particular thing. Um, probably the Panama Papers would be very very much high up there, right? And so. For those of you who don't know it, um, it was the biggest data journalism leak in in history. It was 
the biggest news story of the first half of 2016. The second half of 2016 had Brexit and Trump, fun, yeah. <laughs> you know, the election of Trump, right? But the, the first half, that was the biggest news story of 2016, um, investigating a lot of people using offshore tax accounts for avoiding to pay taxes, basically. And several prime ministers in the world were in there, were uncovered, thanks to a lot of hard work by over 200 journalists across the globe. And they are on the record saying that without Neo4j, it wouldn't have happened, mm. right? So that one is, of course, of course, massive. Um, but there's over 20 independent projects using Neo4j to find the cure for cancer. And if I have to peel away everything, that's probably the most motivating thing for me. Every single one of us here, you, yeah. me, everyone on the call here, Without, without one or maybe two hops out in, in, in our own personal graphs, we have people who have been impacted by cancer, right? And so if there's anything we can do in, in any way and shape and form to help contribute to finding the cure for cancer or a cure for, for cancer, that will also obviously be absolutely exceptional. So that probably is what I would say, like the, yeah, the impact we see from our, from our te technology in the broader world is, is very much, much high up there. And I mean, that's such a unique sort of pleasure to take, like, okay, this is a technical problem that we're solving. And, you know, in the early days, you hope that other people have the same kind of problem, that this is successful, but it's gone well beyond that. It's like, oh, actually, there's a social good that happens yeah. because this exists yeah. that you couldn't have conceived of, yeah. like maybe conceived of, but like, oh, wouldn't it be neat? But like, it's happening. Yeah, The world is better because of this. And, and this is one of the very like just intellectually interesting things about building horizontal infrastructure technology, mm -hmm. right? Because ultimately, if you build a, like a vertical SaaS application selling into HR, solving a specific business problem, like that can be very satisfying because mm -hmm. you have a very direct connection to the people being impacted by that. For us though, like we, we don't have that direct connection. We're typically embedded in a project that then solves a particular problem, right? Yeah. On the flip side though, the variety of use cases, it's just, it's just exceptional, right? And so I think that on the code thing, I want to make sure <laughs> I was trying to avoid it. Uh, yeah, sadly, Michael, there's uh, very little time for me to code uh, these days. I still play around with our products quite a lot, uh, but I never have, have time to code. And I don't even know if I know how to do it anymore. I'd like to think that I that I can that I can still code, but um, it's I'm, so nice I'm, I'm when very to rusty. See code when you see yeah. a presentation, and look, oh, there, there's yeah. code, yeah. and you recognize yeah. it. Yeah, I recognize like, it. I can still read. Yeah, but, but there is an interesting like internal presentation from um, uh, when we a couple of months ago when we yeah. talked about Neo 4 J five. Which, by the way, I hope you've checked out Neo 4 J five because holy crap, it's like it's the biggest release we've done in three years. It, it has so much amazing stuff in it. But anyways, with the, like, there was an internal presentation a few months ago when Ivan, the, the lead PM for the database, was talking about, um, hmm. about all the, not even all, 5% of all the goodies in, in the FJ5 because it's such a massive release. And there's one slide when he showed some driver code. Hmm. And I was sitting there in the audience staring at it for like a minute trying to figure out which programming language it was Ouch. and ultimately failing. Ouch. <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so that sucked. <laughs> it's like, if you needed any more evidence of how post-technical I've become, <laughs> there you have it. Is that Rust? Uh, That's a language? Is yes. that a, yeah, is that <laughs> Python? Oh, Camel? We, you know? we have time for maybe one more question to kind of get through. And I'd love your, your uh, reaction to this. So we ask people like, you know, we've had amazing content, lots of really great talks, lots of good speakers. What would you love to hear more about? One of the sessions that came up that I, that I thought was really worth digging into um, was about, it was with our friends at Databricks. Mm -hmm. and I say that genuinely, friends, right? Yeah, totally. Um, and the session was connected data lake house, Neo4j and Databricks reference data architecture. Okay, uh, what can you share with us about data lakes, houses, <laughs> what, what are the terms even? Oh man, yeah, this is such a dear topic of mine, right near and dear to my heart. I can talk for hours about this, mm -hmm. uh, but in the in the few minutes that we have, maybe maybe a couple of things that I'd like to call out, yeah. right? 
One is, I only alluded to this before in the five to 10 year lookout, but the impact of relationships and data on the broader universe of machine learning cannot be overestimated. It's, it's just, it's going to be a massive, massive thing over the next, you know, three to five to seven, seven years. Um, and we've seen that at bigger organizations like Google, for example, shifted their entire machine learning away to what they call graph based machine learning five to seven years ago, which is basically saying, you know what, we're not just going to look at isolated data point. We're also going to look at the relationships between them to inform our predictive models. Right. And so they, they did that you know, five plus years ago. And there's kind of this notion of where Google lived five years ago is where the rest of the universe lives today, right? Because mm, they, right. they deal at much, they kind of live in the future with, with, with the scale that they're operating at, right? And so that's kind of the promise and the premise behind our graph data science product, mm. right? Which I hope many of you on the, on the call are, are familiar with. And so then, like, how do you then marry that up with the analytical data stores, right? So I think yeah. of the snowflakes and the Databricks is in the broader category of analytical data stores. And I think that's what this, this question alludes, um, alludes to. And, and there's a lot of interesting things going on there. We have a close partnership with, with Databricks, which, which helps put together the broader data lake architecture that they have with... Uh, an instance of Neo4j or a cluster of Neo4j and graph data science and make that operate really, really well together. Um, we've also started talking more recently about the knowledge lake architecture. Right. And the knowledge lake architecture, I'm personally very excited about because it's a, it's a way of reducing friction for adoption of GDS, of graph data science, inside of the broader enterprise, where you can build up an, a graph-shaped replica of data you already have in your data lake house, mm -hmm. right? In your data lake, your data lake house, or in your data warehouse, right? Okay. Whatever instance or maturity you're on for, for your analytical data store, uh, you know, architecture. And you can already, you can reshape that in graph form so that you can easily tap into that for all your machine learning projects. So we call, we call that the, 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 the data lake house, right? And so, so that's an, like a really important, um, important initiative that we've been spending a lot of time on recently. So this is part about the, the overall growing maturity of the category, dovetailing with other categories and like all of it, you know, is part of this connected future, really. It's a connected future, which is data, but also technologies. This is where we're gonna live. That's right. And then very importantly for us, right, is the, is the whole, it's both for developers, but now also for data scientists and yeah. data engineers. And I think that that's a really exciting part about the broader platform that uh, that we're building Work, out. Working hand in hand. Working hand in hand, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right, fantastic. And well, always a pleasure to hear your thoughts on anything, life, the universe, and technology. Thank you for your time today. Thank you everybody for tuning into this session. This is the end of this, this phase. We, we're gonna be moving on um, in a couple of hours. Europe is going to wake up. Some of Europe, I guess, is already awake. Um, so come back for that. If you're, if you're up for it, we'll be back for another session as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. <laughs>